it's an honor um, and a privilege to be here. Thank you for the, for the invitation. Uh, I certainly hope that this institute, and here I agree with yours, that is well known well beyond uh, Ireland and Brussels. As a matter of fact, I was um, contacted uh, by John Biley, who mentioned, who was, when he realized that I'd be speaking here today, asked me to convey um, uh, his sincere wishes from his side as well, that we'll be able to today begin a discussion uh, that will help promote solutions to an issue that's preoccupying this industry terribly. One of, the, one of the many positives of this afternoon's event is the crisp user-friendly focus um, on a core issue, and I certainly look forward to, to the discussion uh, with you and with yours, uh, whom we all know and respect, but I do not share his views. Um, I've been asked to outline the views of the European airline industry, and they are distinctly different uh, to those expressed by the Commission in the past months and again uh, today. In our view, the EU ETS has led us, uh, despite its good intentions, into a mess. And the only good news is that politicians uh, still have a limited window of opportunity to fix it. Otherwise, as of the first quarter of 2013, the mess will turn into a serious trade conflict over compliance. Yes, there are plenty of people out there warning against the risks of a trade conflict, but equally plenty of levers dragging us into this swamp. So why is this such a mess? Well, let's have a look at the interests of the individual stakeholders. For airlines, the EU ETS is a cost factor. It is a further cost burden which comes at a time of economic decline and which will increase from 458 million per annum this year for AEA's members alone to 1.8 billion in 2020. That is not a limited impact by any standards. Now, AEA reported an average profit of 2.4 euros per passenger for its airlines in 2011. According to the Commission studies, the ETS costs will amount to anywhere between 2 and 12 euros per passenger, and that is, in itself, sufficient to wipe out any perspectives of profitability in the foreseeable future. There is no room for any sort of windfall profits. This is a further cost burden. So why is there no cost pass-through? Well, if there were, airlines would never report losses. But the issue is actually more complicated. The question is, how will this cost be distributed amongst the airlines? Now, as you know, airlines receive a free allocation of certificates corresponding to 85% of the individual airline's share of the CO2 emissions between 2004 and 2006. That's like telling guests in a restaurant that they'll get their main course for free telling airlines they need to buy the certificates needed for the actual emissions in 2012 is like telling those same guests that they'll have to pay for the dessert. So do those that order a dessert pay only for that, or do they have to share the costs for the entire meal, or to stay in the ETS speak? Should only those airlines that have had the temerity to grow in size to succeed in their business, do those have to pay extra, Latin American carriers, for example, that have grown consistently since 2004 to 2006 feel disadvantaged because with the certificates that they have to buy, they believe that they indirectly cross-subsidize the airlines that have grown less. So the estimated 705 million bill for the whole industry in year one are not shared equally across the board. European airlines see it differently again. 100% of European airlines' network is covered by the EU ETS. In other words, all emissions are catered for. But for a non-European airline, only to the degree they fly to or from Europe. For Cathay Pacific, this means that 15%, not 100, are covered. If the airline sector is to pay for emissions and accept the extra cost, then surely this should be on a non-discriminatory basis. A regional scheme targets the airlines based in its region who thus feel disadvantaged, but in this case, no one's happy. Third country carriers question whether they're being charged in a manner which adequately reflects their share of the total emissions. The other stakeholders are the regulators. European governments have shown themselves very apt and highly innovative in developing schemes. The ETS for stationary emitters are, uh, was developed to help the European governments reach the Kyoto targets. Because the emitters are stationary and the levers the ETS provides can actually incentivize investments into environmentally friendly energy sources, it can be argued 
that the scheme worked. But with mobile emitters, such as aircraft, the situation is different. And the issue, one is, the issue is one of principle. Mobile emitters do not emit simply in the aerospace above the territory of one nation, but of several, and also above no man's land, the high seas. So who has the jurisdiction to determine the manner in which governments treat mobile emitters in the airspace of another country or over the high seas? The European Union's answer to that is that for all flights from the European Union, as Jos outlined, and for all flights to the European Union, the EU decides what has to be paid. So emissions from an aircraft of, say, United Airlines over the United States, between the USA and Canada, and over the North Atlantic, are governed by rules determined by the EU institutions. Major trading nations have taken issue with this unilateral approach, and indeed the storied insult extraterritoriality extra has been thrown just for once in an easterly direction across the Atlantic. As one Asian friend coined it, the EU has replaced US imperialism by EU imperialism. Another re issue related to this is why airlines of the world should be subjected to an auctioning process of European governments and effectively have to buy certificates from those European governments if at least the revenues generated by the ETS would benefit the environment. No, the EU ETS directive says that revenues generated by auctioning should, but not must, be used for the benefit of the environment. In fact, several European governments have budgeted the revenues from 2013 and beyond as general revenue. It is de facto an additional tax, in addition to the national aviation taxes, the ADP in the UK, and so on. The third aggra aggravation the EU ETS has given rise to is the lack of cohesion. Airlines pay manifold for so-called environmental levies. We estimate that in total the costs of national and EU cost factors amount to about 5 billion per annum, that's for a sector that expects to lose between 1 and 2 billion in 2012 alone. The struggling European airline sector needs to reduce internal costs, reduce kerosene costs, which amount to 34% of total costs. It is the kerosene costs that are the drivers of fuel efficiency nowadays. But airlines also have to be able to invest into modern technology and rely on a modern, future-oriented infrastructure policy. A European single sky is the single biggest environmental protection program which would reduce fuel consumption by 12% and enable 16 million tonnes less CO2 to be emitted in European airspace. But probably the single biggest source of aggravation is where does Europe get its confidence from to claim that what is good for Europe must be good for the rest of the world? This has given rise to distrust and misgivings. A picture of gloom and doom? No. I mentioned the good news. Politicians still have a window of opportunity. First of all, the EC, and I particularly look at Jos Delbecke here, deserves credit for having sensitized a wider world audience to the need for market-based measures in aviation. Although we contribute just 3% of the total greenhouse gas emissions, that is 3% too much, we must not look out not only at infrastructural, operational, and technological, but also at market-based measures to address the environmental impact of our sector. That message is now understood everywhere. ETS does not have a visibility of name recognition problem. And the more far-sighted amongst the aviation community recognize what ETS is trying to do. They also have a degree of understanding for the reasons that the EU has pushed ahead alone, in particular their frustrations at the ICAO process. In fact, I can go to basically any event in the world. As soon as I mention I represent the European airline sector, the reaction I get is an empathetic nod, and then I hear, yes, yes, EU ETS, that is your problem. Secondly, the good news is that the industry has understood the message. IATA and the entire global aviation sector, as a sector, agreed on goals to reduce the impact of aviation on greenhouse gas emissions. Aviation is one of the only few international industries that have subscribed to short, mid, and long-term goals, and the EU ETS has had the effect of a catalyst in that process. But of course we insist that European governments walk their talk. Investments into CESAR and biofuels, as well as the political will to implement a single European sky, are key for efficiency gains, 
and the ETS should not be a revenue source to reduce state, set, state deficits, but likewise an environmental greenhouse gas emissions program. Ladies and gentlemen, the environmental challenge is a global challenge, not a European one. But the world has not really developed much in terms of solutions, and that is actually extraordinary because ICAO, the UN body responsible for civil aviation, has an excellent track record for solutions. From a regulatory perspective, ICAO has dealt with the environmental impacts of aviation since the 1960s. In 1971, it adopted the first binding noise standards. In 1981, the first standards for aircraft engine emissions. And since, the stringency of these standards has been regularly increased. And then there's no reason to believe that ICAO cannot come up with sensible standards for CO2 emissions. At the 1992 Rio conference, the international community stressed those environmental measures addressing global uh, stress that environmental measures addressing global environmental problems should be based on an international consensus. Twenty years later, this core principle of environmental law is more valid than ever. But by seeking to impose a policy on other sovereign countries, the EU has turned a good concept into an international diplomatic problem where Hillary Clinton, it was mentioned, writes letters to her counterparts in Europe, where the Chinese government is alarmed, where the Indian minister says that the European airlines must be punished, and where the US, India, and China discuss anti-EU ETS laws which forbid compliance for their airlines with the EU ETS scheme. The uniting effect of ETS has unfortunately been more about the US and Cuba, presumably temporarily, seeing eye to eye in their mutual loathing for ETS, that it has been about creating a consensus on how to act to curb aviation emissions. And the more these concerns are brushed aside by Europeans as posturing, the greater the likelihood that non-European countries will, and be it only in the interest to save face, turn their warnings into reality. European airlines face the severe and concrete perspective of reprisals, non-compliance of non-European airlines and therefore discrimination, and further non-aligned ETSs and taxes by third countries. The European aircraft manufacturing industry is already being targeted. According to Airbus, the approval for 14 billion worth of Airbus orders has been suspended by China in protest to the EU ETS, putting more than 2,000 Airbus jobs at risk. We cannot continue down this road. Instead of trying to find a legalistic agreement on the EU ETS, we must seek an environmentally driven agreement on a global solution to aviation's emissions. Politicians have a window of opportunity to sort out the mess and return to an environmental agenda. It is between now and the end of this year. By then at the latest, IKEA will have to be able to present a framework which is sufficiently robust to determine the further environmental agenda. Our attention must now be on Montreal and no longer on Brussels. Now, many have the impression that a global deal is a remote perspective, but they're mistaken. Firstly, we have a general consensus that the global approach should include a market-based measure or measures, cap and trade and offsetting being the preferred candidates. Secondly, several key actors have laid down their conditions. For these to be overcome, we need to be realistic. ICAO may not be able to deliver a one-size-fits-all model uh, out of the blue, but it could deliver in a first stage a framework to which all players can relate. Why? Because all players have expressed a desire to see certain principles enshrined in an international agreement. For example, the need to distinguish between national airspace and high seas. Such principles could go beyond aspirational goals, even if they initially fall short of binding targets for all ICAO members. As a first step, such a broad consensus on principles would be a roof under which delegations can lay out the details. For over 10 years, the European Union and most, if not all, ICAO member states have been advocating an ICAO-led model. The initial framework agreement I'm advocating would provide for clearer guidance on what such a model could consist of and would provide for a forum to constructively reach out for solutions instead of political discussions about sovereignty. Time has come from governments to address the need for and possible broad content of an ICAO-led solution. Time has come for constructive discussions. I personally also think we cannot leave all the hard work of consensus building to beleaguered officialdom in Montreal. And we should find a way to convene a meeting of a number of governments to discuss how to promote the ICAO deal. Now, some are using 1989 analogies urging the EU to tear down this ETS 
which has had the effect of yet another wall. I myself think that this is to underestimate both the strength of support for ETS in Europe and indeed underestimate the need to actually take action on aviation emissions. I frankly can understand why European governments are not yet ready to suspend ETS or to bring it to an end. But the EU institutions in turn must understand that a large part of the world is angry and waiting for the EU to give a clear lead in ICAO. Without a concerted and ambitious approach in Montreal, I do fear we're on the way to a highly destructive and unprecedented trade war in which all will be damaged and only Europe and not only Europe will lose, but Europe certainly will. In short, the year of comparison is probably not 1989, but time is getting short. To perhaps modify a quote from a US president, yes, ICAO can. Thank you.